My name is Eric Moses. I'm the Director of Research and Strategy at PET, and I'm here to introduce actually my team, talk about connection at 30,000 30, feet, 500 miles per hour. This is a story about in-flight connectivity. Maybe some of you have actually experienced that when you've been on the flight, because I assume quite a, bit, quite a, bit, a few people here flew here. So I'm here with my colleagues, um, Jim Costello from Telephonics. He's at our sister company. Jim is the chief technical officer there. And then Dave Carlson as well. He's the director of software engineering at PDT. They're, they were key on this program. It's going to tell you about some of the back-end innovation challenges and uh, outcomes that we had, successful outcomes that we had on this program. A little bit about PDT and Telephonics. PDT is a full-service product development global organization. Um, we're headquartered up just outside of Lake Zurich. We also have an office in uh, Europe as well, and then a few other ones spread out. Um, we work primarily in the life sciences, uh, public safety, and consumer spaces. And then Telephonics, our sister company, they're a technology design and manufacturing firm, also located outside Chicago, and they work in highly regulated industries such as this. We're talking about aerospace. And we're, talk we're going to tell you a story about how we partnered with GoGo, our client here, to develop the next, in next gen innovation platform for in flight connectivity. Does anybody know GoGo? Show of hands. Okay, so you do know the name. So, how many people actually did fly here versus drive? I imagine pretty much everyone, right? Anyone actually use GoGo connectivity before? Either on this flight or before? Yeah? What did you use it for, if you don't mind? What, like what were you doing? Surfing the net, checking your personal email, work. What was the sort of the use case? Checking all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> How did you like the experience? It was actually great. Mm -hmm. Great experience. Okay. Uh, and how did you access that? I assume it's on a mobile device, but is that a laptop? Is it a smartphone? So I've, done, I've done on uh, my uh, iPad as well as my uh, laptop. Okay. Any differences between that? So we all know that people, you know, smartphones today are ubiquitous, right? Roughly 40% of people have them. But there's roughly a two to one ratio of people that have them when they're on an airline. And that's a big impact in terms of talking about the sort of demographic of people that are flying to people like us, right? For the most part that we fit into that conversation. You know, always connected, right? And what does that mean for some of your expectations in terms of the product and the service and how that is utilized, right? In terms of speed and efficiency and intuitiveness. But actually, and it's so important that people will actually give up an amenity to actually get in-flight connectivity, not necessarily have to pay for it. You know, so the scenario is, if you could give up any other amenity online or in the air, what would that be? And 90% of the people said they would actually do that. Any guesses on what that amenity is? Food? 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 Food. Bathroom. <laughs> so think about that, right? Think about that in the context that we're talking about here, right? We're at a conference, and let's say you have the choice between food, going to the bathroom, or Wi-Fi, going to the bathroom, you're picking Wi-Fi over that. So it's not necessarily a need, it's a sort of emotional preference thing, but you're picking that or something you might actually need. So it's pretty astounding when we have covered that. So obviously, this is very important, right? We all sort of expect to be connected nowadays pretty much anywhere we go, and it wasn't necessarily like that uh, not too long ago. But those expectations really, you know, I think when you dig down deeper and sort of think about what that is, you know, the connectivity that we have when we're walking around, when we're at work, when we're at home, is sort of uh, lending itself to be, we have those same um, expectations of being connected on the, on the flight as well, in terms of speed, in terms of efficiency. There's sort of, there isn't really, uh, I think, a gap in the consumer's mind in terms of how you connect at home versus how you connect in the, in the uh, airline and then having a difference between that, right? If it's slower, it's going to be a bad negative experience for me, and that's not something that we want to put up with. So we know it's important, but as general consumers, right, we don't really care how we get it. I mean, me as a product developer, I, I sort of, and Jim and Dave, we probably like the background sort of information on how that actually works, but the general consumer, you know, if I ask my mom or someone else that's going to go flying, they don't really care how it's done. They just want it to be done, right? So we expect it, but we don't really care about how it's done. We're going to tell you a story about some of the development process of uh, developing the GoGo 
uh, innovation server from the first generation to the next one and sort of what, what insights went into connecting the dots between the insight as well as the uh, execution of that insight. And really what we're talking about here is an infrastructure of innovation. So you've sort of heard that through a lot of the conversations that we've had here today. It's not just about the product itself and that the product has to have innovation to it or the right people have to be involved. You also have to have process as well and those processes support the innovation. Right? So we're talking here about but some of the key themes here throughout are modularity, uh, the collaboration, and the process. And we also had uh, some time constraints on our side as well. And I think that's something that you know, when we heard the first uh, speech in the morning about Thomas Edison and some of the challenges that he had and how, how he sort of worked around those, I think that artificial constraint of time and being very mission critical is something that maybe you can all think about as well and how to apply that to your industry, right? So let's say we work in a consulting environment, we might work in a medical or here in a highly regulated industry a product that goes on an airline, if something goes wrong with that product, it's a really big deal, right? It's not like you designed the cell phone wrong and they can't necessarily um, touch the keys, right, or get to the right information. It's a real big deal. So I would encourage you to sort of look at this case study and try to take away some insights from here and look at that and how do you apply that to your products and your innovation processes as well. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Jim and Dave and they're going to sort of take you through the rest of that. Okay, so one of the first questions is why did GoGo engage us? Uh, myself and Telefonics, I was the prime manufacturer and the designer for the box. So GoGo came to us and what they were looking for was a, they've been working with a number of very large companies in the aviation space and over time, probably over the last six or seven years, they developed relationships with those firms but none of them were really coming across with innovation nor were they really kind of what I would consider being nimble partners. In fact, over time, they probably became slower and slower in terms of meeting the requirements of, of this cus particular customer. And the customer, GoGo, were really looking for something that was going to take them further along. So they had actually developed this product, put it out into service in 2008. Here we are in 2014, and the environment's changing very much. One of the other things, though, that was important to GoGo was they were looking for a company like PDT and Telephonics that were comfortable in establishing a process one of the key things too is that we, were all, we both were local, actually within the same vicinity. Uh, they are located in Itasca, Illinois, as was mentioned. PDT is in Lake Zurich, Telephonics is in Waukee. And one of the things was we were actually able to go down and drive to their facility and sit with their engineers, sit with their marketing people and try to understand more specifically what were the problems. And the same with them. They would come up actually to the PDT location we have collaborative discussions as to how can we make the product better, what was it that we were finally trying to achieve for the end customer, which is really the passenger. And at the end of the day, it's really all about getting a passenger to pick up their device, log on, actually pull their wallet out and spend money. Because at the end of the day, if you don't do that, then the product isn't going to be successful. And what came about over about a 12-month period was this very, very collaborative effort with GoGo and Telephonics and PDT in developing that relationship. And one of the key points here is it wasn't just really a concept of let's just design it for the sake of designing it. We actually had to take it into production because they had a specific time frame and they had a specific need in terms of getting the product out there and a new product out there to be able to kind of, I would almost say, you know, give them a shot in the arm in terms of their competition to give them a new offering, a new set of service offerings. So let me just kind of touch base, go back a little bit in time, back in 2008, the GoGo service was pretty much just Wi-Fi, was you could come out with your laptop, and if you think about it, the Apple iPhone was really just introduced in like the 2007 time period. So not too long ago, people were now starting to get smartphones and they were coming on board an airplane, and what did they want to do? They wanted to get their email and they wanted to do web browsing. And that was sufficient enough for a passenger back in 2008 to be able to get um, a service that they consider to be sufficient to meet their needs. And basically this was a connectivity between the airplane and in the GoGo network in North America, they have a little over 100 radio base stations, whereas the airplane's flying across the country, it's communicating to each one of these towers and as it traverses across the country, it's handing off that information, handing off that connection from one tower to the next. And that's actually how it you know, works in a very simplistic fashion. So, this picture here just gives you more or less some, um, a diagram of how the system's actually connected. 
Back in 2008, there was a box, a server unit that was called an ACPU-1, which is basically a server unit that allowed communication to go back and forth down to, the, down to a tower. And this is no different, really, than cellular technology. And within the aircraft were wireless access points, no different than if you were to go to a Starbucks, you open up your client device, you got a splash page that was actually loaded from the ACPU-1 to the device, you asked for some billing information, through that access point you made the connection down to the ground. And it was very much that simple. At that point in time, all, the, all that GoGo were trying to do was support airlines in North America. Again, this is back in 2008. So now, fast forward, we're now in 2014, and as was mentioned earlier, customer expectations are always changing. Not only do you want Wi-Fi and your email connection and web browsing, but now all of a sudden you want to be entertained. If I didn't load my iPad or my, my computer with a movie, now I want to watch a movie on board. I want to be able to get media content loaded to me, such as audio. Um, basically what we're doing is we're taking a product that me starts meeting the applications that people are using in their daily life on the ground. Everything from texting to tweeting to all different types of applications via weather. Things that we could actually house on the airplane so they don't necessarily have to go off the airplane in order to get that information and use up bandwidth. So with the ACPU2, what we're talking about now is a unit that not only allows the connectivity, but also allows much more stored content and media to be presented to the passengers, which was totally different than where people's heads were at back in 2008, because that wasn't really what people were looking for. So now we move 2014, very similar, we still have an ACPU2 that's talking to ground tower. And I mentioned earlier there's about 100 ground stations located across North America, but now all of a sudden their customer base has changed. They now have Delta Airlines, and Delta flies to South America, Delta flies to Europe. Now all of a sudden customers want to be connected even when they go overseas, not just over North America. So the introduction of this ACPU2 server unit that, that we built actually now allows that set satellite communication um, and provides passenger services as you fly over the ocean. Again, a new service, a new expansion of ideas, and what we had to do is develop the product around what the customer expectation was as it's, you know, time has, has moved on. So how does it work? The aircraft server, which is the box down on the far left, is actually located down, down near the cargo bay, down in the belly of the airplane and it's connected to an antenna that communicates down to the ground. You have these access points over here on the right, and there's three of them, and they're located within the cabin. And those are what's actually communicating to the passenger device. So when you do open up your, your device, you see go, go, in flight, you see the SSID. Those are all coming from the wireless access point, and they're allowing the communication between your device back to the server unit, which then allows the connectivity down to the ground, either over air to ground or over satellite. Now one of the key things that we were asked to address going forward was, well, not only do we want this to, to have a lot of horsepower and a lot of performance, we also wanted it to be very easy to maintain. So one of the design constraints that we had was it had to be replaced, the box itself had to be removed and replaced, powered up, and back into service within 15 minutes so that they could actually, if a plane was broken, while the plane was deplaning and before the next flight took off, we could actually swap out the hardware. That was one of the going in requirements was not only looking at it for the passengers, but looking at it from the airline perspective too, as to how quickly we could get the service back in operation if there happened to be a problem that occurred. So, you know, basically, we mentioned earlier, the technology marches on. So people, from a passenger perspective, are continuing to look for more services. But now all of a sudden the airlines also started to look at this and say, wait a minute, I have a communication link down to the ground. Why don't I start using it for operational services? Why don't I get weather maps up to my pilots? Why don't I send manifests back and forth? Why don't I give the flight crew information about what gates you're going to be coming into and what are the next gates for the customers that are on board? So now the airlines are starting to take this whole concept and go beyond just the passenger and starting to look at it from their own operational standpoint. Obviously, from the passenger, passenger perspective, people just want the service to be faster. So basically, they want to also have it operate in other theaters of the world, not just over North America. As I mentioned, they want oceanic coverage. 
They want to be able to get communication no matter what flight that they're on. And generally speaking, you know, when it comes to throughput, it really is a, a question of how much bandwidth you have off of the airplane, you go over satellite or air to ground, and there's more and more competitors coming into the marketplace. So because of that, there's more and more of a push both on GoGo -Go and ourselves to be able to increase the performance of the equipment that, that resides on the airplane. And then storage. Um, storage is just greatly expanding over time. Obviously, many of you buy computers today. Um, you now get solid-state drives um, within your computers that are much larger than once they, they were two years ago. Well, that's becoming more and more port important for this customer because more and more they want to be able to store movies and audio content and, and the like on the airplane and never have to go off to the ground so that when people get on board they can be entertained. And you look at it from a perspective of, okay, that's all about just taking money out of somebody's wallet to show them a movie, but from the airline perspective, they're really looking at it from the standpoint of, how do I make a flight less stressful? The only way to make it less stressful is make the flight go faster, or appear to go faster, and part of that is in the form of entertainment. And that's kind of when you look at the driver of, we obviously were building a hardware so software platform, but if you take it all the way back to the airline and the passenger, what everyone is really trying to do is just try to make travel a little bit more, a little less stressful than it normally normally takes uh, without having any type of connection to your loved ones. So the evolution back in 2008, we were at a, a computer unit that had a 1.2 terabytes of mass storage and just a single 1.6 gigahertz processor. <laughs> and then if we flash forward, we now have a server unit that in essence has four processors in it compared to what it was back in 2008. And it's a 2.1 uh, gigahertz processor, so much, much faster performance. And now we've also doubled the size of mass storage so that it can store more and more content for uh, you know, depicting to the customers, be it audio or video content. So again, if we go back to where, where are we going now, and where are we going in the future? Basically, it's the same tenants that are in place. GoGo is looking for backward compatibility with any product that we were build, including this one, such that it works with the older systems, but they want it scalable and upgradable. Basically, what they don't want to do is have to swap out the complete chipset or the, the complete chassis in the future. They want to be able to get that upgrade capability by removing a module and putting a new module in so that the investment that they made in 2014 is not going to be thrown away in, say, 2016 with the advancement of processors. Same with the upgradability when it comes to mass storage. They continue to want us to be able to push the envelope of where the technology is going to give them more and more services. But what's important to note here is that when it comes to anything that goes on an airplane, it does go through a rigorous set of um, testing that's FAA witnessed because what we have to ensure is for the safety of flight of the airplane, that nothing that we put on board an airplane could be detrimental to safe flight. So sometimes, you know, when you're doing, you're developing products, you know, sometimes like with the Philips Healthcare, you see some of those um, solutions that are nice and beautiful to look at and they're really aesthetically pleasing. But this is actually aesthetically pleasing in a different way, just for the user and the stakeholder group that this is designed for. This is a food production line. So when you look at a design and sort of think about what does that design and the innovation mean in there, there's a lot of different aspects to look at that just outside of the aesthetics and the beauty of that. So sometimes it's in what it looks like, and other times it's in what the benefit is, right? If you think about a smartphone or a tablet, for the most part we don't care what that looks like. What we care about is the information that's displayed on it and the benefit that we're getting from that. So I think that's what we're sort of talking about here. It's not, this is not sort of a, a case study on design beauty and uh, design language evolution. It's not about that. It's about the value that it's trying to provide for this particular industry in this use case for consumers like us. So then, just kind of wrapping up, if you take a look at the internal design, as Eric mentioned, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. But one of the things that we were looking at is anything that we did with this design, we had to look with one eye in the rear view mirror, making sure that it was backward compatible with all the equipment that's already on board the airplane. But then we also had to look forward into our crystal ball to say, well, where is there going to be expansion in the hardware and the software going forward that can increase the life cycle of this box? Uh, part of that, if you look to the left, is uh, one of the first things we did was we set up uh, putting a second processor on board this um, server unit such that one processor can just handle the content and media streaming to passengers. Because believe it or not, there's a lot of people who are watching.
TV and watching movies on board airplanes these days. A lot more than there were, let's say, two years ago. So breaking up the processing capabilities, one being for connectivity and one for streaming media, was pretty critical to this customer. The second was looking at ways that we could increase the, the processing capability of the unit. Uh, in this product, we have a uh, third generation Intel i7 processor unit, but there are already an industrial grade fourth generation processor that's coming available. So the GoGo is looking for us to be able to upgrade our unit without removing and replacing the complete box and throwing it away. Rather, they're looking for that upgradability. And then, again, scalability. They're always looking for us to be able to increase storage size, um, increase, increase RAM on board, the, on board the box. Anything that we can expand upon to make the performance greater without throwing away the initial investment that was key to them. Let me introduce uh, Dave Carlson. He'll talk about the software development. All right. Hello, I hope, you know, a lot of this was just trying to show the techno technology that had to go behind there. And when you think about the time scale and the process and the regulation that representing the software engineering and the electrical engineering and the rest of the engineering departments we had, you know, it was very, very important that we had to do things effectively. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that we thought about going from the time we got these marketing requirements, the time Telefonics and PDT and GoGo put this together, to how engineering from software, electrical, we're all mechanical, we're all brought in up front. You know, there's gonna be a lot of similarities between what I speak to and what was mentioned in the Phillips slides as far as how do you pull some of the stuff that happens in the back end all the way up to the front end to make sure that you are truly making the right decisions up front, that the engineering teams and your execution path on the back end are not gonna hit hiccups, you know, requirements churn, feature churn, Everything that we're stuck with when the date cannot move and we're, you know, I like to consider software sort of at the end of the train. Well, system test is one step behind us. And if the date cannot move, everything gets compressed. So, you know, one of the big things, you know, is time. Some general terms that people like to throw out all the time is, you know, identifying our key resources, whether that's people, whether it's processes, whether it's actually technologies to help manage, communicate, collaborate. You know, these here tiger teams. I'm not sure who are familiar with Tiger Teams and what that team actually that term actually means. All right, nothing new, but I've had Tiger Teams where people it's highly ineffective. People weren't using the right tools. People were not managed the proper way, and it actually caused more problems than it should have solved. Um, in an iterative phase development, everyone likes to talk about this agile, iterative, but you know they're all fancy terms. But if you don't understand how to manage them and you don't have the tools to do it, you're not going to get anywhere. The other challenge was overall integration. We're dealing with a very complex hardware that had to be custom made, fit into a custom mechanical housing, fit into and attached to an airplane system, as well as deal with our customer's application software and our manufacturing needs, and all in a 12 month period. Um, from PDT's point of view, my team was actually staffed in, you know, in charge of, you need to develop the, you know, put the OS on there, enable all the hardware functionalities that are on there to actually work, such that GoGo can come in with their application and seamlessly put it on there. But we don't really have any requirements from them up front. And so how did we do this? Early on I said, okay, well let me understand your application interface needs. Let me understand from Telefonics what your manufacturing requirements are. We have to get the hardware enabled. We have to put the board support package on there. Why do we need, and what we have to develop the software for the acceptance test plan? How can we make our software so that we only have to write it once? But yet, GoGo can actually use it in their production software. Telephonics can use it in their manufacturing. And it's being tested throughout the whole development life cycle, such that you're just getting everything done up front and not phase gating it through like true system test cycles. So that was one of the challenges. <coughs> so we had to come up with some, what I'll call process, you know, process innovation. I like to say innovation is relative. We're a consulting firm. A lot of us come from big, large companies in the past. And depending on what company you're in, what perspective you're, you were from, it's all relative. Some companies are truly innovative. Some like to say they're innovative, but they're not. And us being the consulting firm, working with two other companies, how do you get everyone to come together to meet these challenging goals and actually make the product successful, deliver on time, and keep the finger pointing and all the other stuff that goes along with some general politics at bay, right? And then my, you know, my uh, personal opinion, we set out to do this, and some people, I hope a lot of people know this, 
just in general, project management plans, program management plans. There's nothing fancy about this stuff. This stuff has been around forever. But going back to what the Phillips you know, speaker said, it was the same thing. We have a checklist. We actually walk through, and as soon as the engineering, and as soon as our marketing people are engaged, the very first thing we want to do is actually take the scope of work, the marketing requirements, documents, get it into our lead engineer's hands, give them our templates and our, and our, and our process stuff, and actually say, for you to be as successful as possible, I want you to tell me what you would do, how you would do it, what you would get rid of, and what tools, processes, people. You know, a lot of, a lot of stuff comes down to people when they're given the authority to make the decisions and are held accountable, they'll produce better work. If you actually have processes that are put in place for other projects, other people, other design firms, and you're being, you know, it's being wedged down your throat, people will take sort of the opinion of saying, Hey, you know, I can't be held accountable. You guys, I had no, you know, I had no say in how we we're going to do this. You set the timetable, and there's sort of that lack of accountability. And so, going through here, and you talk about project teams. We actually set up uh, Tiger teams and actually wrote uh, locations. We dedicated locations in all three of our offices, and we actually worked through the management process to say on certain days, based on what was going on. We'd have people coming from Telephonics down to PDT. We'd have people from GoGo coming to PDT based on where we were in the development process. At other times, Telephonics and PDT would be going down and sitting in GoGo's lab, sitting right next to their engineers. And it was all about trying to collaborate and understand up front what we didn't have in paper and documentation to meet the scheduled deadline. If we did not actually put those people and have them coming back with reports saying, hey, this is what we need to do. This is what their best practices are. This is what your best practices are. Here's their process. You know, can you tailor it? Very hard things, you know, politics come into play, processes come into play. It's a very, you know, very intermingled web to have to deal with. So one of the, you know, one of the things was just the resources, co-located workspaces. What I'd like to say is process, you know, my view is sort of like doing a dance, right? Process should never be there for process sake. Processes should be tailored. And when you're managing and you're doing things, you know, look at you as like the conductor. You got people who have to do the line dance. You got people who have to do, you know, the waltz. You have other people that are doing backspins. And how did you plan for when the guy who's doing the backspin happens to move out of his thing and hits the line dancers in your schedule? Did you plan for that up front? Did you do your risk mitigation already up front? Do you have plans in place that say, hey, when I do not meet this delivery date because my risk assessment up front said we had a 60% chance of making it? If you don't have your plans in place and the people and everything that you want to do ready and already planned for, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to meet those dates. And how, you, how do you do this? Once again, you know, I'm, the Phillips brought lots of stuff you know, to mind. Past programs, past experiences, they get lost in large companies. You have so many people that will make the same mistake multiple times because they don't have a way of populating and having that information percolate to a common resource where you can actually go and view it and pull that information out and say, oh yes, uh, you know, there was a similar project, let me get the reference name, and I'm gonna go call that guy, right? Where do you go for this information? You know, you've got a plan for it. So for this project, off-the-shelf tools, right? We're a consulting firm. We try not to spend money of our clients if we don't have to. There's a lot of open source tools, there's a lot of sort of open source and uh, free you know, software out there to help us. One of them is just Jira. You know, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details, but it's an online tool where everyone who's on the project actually gets access to it. You set up components, you set up owners, you set up email privileges. People who want to be notified when things are changing and comments are added and if something changed, if a problem happened and a bug was, a bug was found, it gets sent out to everybody. You have no excuse for why you can say, oh, I didn't get the email. Oh, it was an Excel spreadsheet that I didn't see. Oh, it's in someone's inbox. They forgot to tell me I didn't get that report. Right? Collaboration is about having the information. If you don't have the information, how can you act? I have people on my software development team who aren't involved in a lot of projects, but they're actually on the email distribution list for all the other projects that we're going on because I want them to see problems that are popping up such that they can actually go and go, hey, Jim, I saw that you just had this problem. This is how we addressed it earlier. Right? If, if, we, if you don't have the ability to have team meetings and you don't have the ability to you know, disseminate that information, you can be sitting there for three weeks on a problem that the guy, you know, two working on a different project, three rows down, had already solved for you know for some other application. 
So how do you actually put tools and actually use them you know, for your benefit is, is very key. Um, just one more thing. So when we had the, uh, well, lots more than one more thing. When we're talking about hardware, one, one key thing was if you look at the technology that's actually in this box, and it's gotta be customized. The Philips guy brought up a great example and I talked to him afterwards. You know, he's like, we, do, we go in five day things that they wanna take from a concept to actually something that someone's testing on the fifth day. And my first thing was, well, you're using evaluation kits that's not being written from scratch. You basically have hardware and software at a fundamental level that you're utilizing. And the same thing had to occur in this process is we looked out there. We went out there and said, okay, what companies have reference designs for some of the hardware? What companies have evaluation kits that come with supported software such that we can actually build into our software development teams, these, we call them like Frankenstein or breadboards. Start piecing together all these things that look very ugly, you've got all these wires running all over the place, but fundamentally it allows you to develop on it just like it's the real hardware, and it allows you to test a lot of stuff like it's the real hardware. In the meantime, the real hardware is still sitting in our electrical engineers guys are laying out all the schematics and everything. We had to get a jump start on this. And you know, taking advantage of lots of things that are out there. Who knows of the kid who did the Lego Brailler? Did anyone hear this story? So Lego has like engineering kits for kids. You can build stuff that got some electronics and you can program it. And I'm, I don't quote me on this, but I think he was a 10 or 12 year old. He actually went out, Home Depot, he bought a roll of tape, like printer tape, he brought some uh, like nails that his dad helped him buy, and he actually turned the Lego evaluation kit into a brailler. He actually was able to program it, where it actually was able to convert what he was doing and actually put braille onto a roll of tape. You know, we have to take sort of that same philosophy now. Take what's already out there and what people have already done and they're willing to, willing to give you, and how do you leverage it to meet your time, to meet your delivery schedules, not only from a process standpoint, but from the engineering standpoint as well. A lot of things that we talked about was like front end, front end innovation. You know, the guy talked about from uh, Mattel. Why did the light go off at the end of the tunnel? I didn't raise my hand because I wanted to say this. Is in my opinion and my experience is the light goes off at the end of the tunnel because bad decisions and bad sort of choices on other projects ate away the development budget, took away the resources, and took away the ability to actually keep that light on, right? And how did those things happen? A lot of the front end didn't actually match the back end. And the problems and the risks weren't identified. The workarounds and the solutions to get around those problems were not in place. And the fact that programs slipped three months, took you know 20 year developers to actually be applied over on this group's project to try and meet their schedule, where did the money go? The money went to trying to support a project that probably should never have hit those problems anyways. So I like to think when you're thinking from back-end innovation, how does the back-end actually enable the front-end, right? The back-end's already for a project that the front-end people already solved or thought they met the needs and are, 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 they're moved on to the next thing. But it's up to the people on the back-end to manage it such that you meet your deadlines, you meet your cost structures, and you do not take away the budget from the other projects that are out there that are gonna make your company more money and feedback through that process train. Uh, my last sort of closing thing is, do, everyone works in large companies, or the majority of people here might work in large companies, and my previous experience was that you had your marketing you, and stuff was being pushed down. And when engineering teams or another group actually said what they thought and, what, and how they'd like to do it, it was sort of looked upon, you know, like, no, no, you know, we don't necessarily believe you. But if you were actually putting your money and you were brought in an outside consulting firm, and you were, you were going through and the consulting firm was coming back to you saying, oh, this is how you should do it, would you still sit there and go, no, that's not how we're gonna do it? So why is it different internal to your companies and some of that culture, and how can you sort of break down those barriers of saying that, hey, we have experts for reasons, right? We have to leverage on their opinion, we have to hold them accountable, right? They're there, we're paying them. They must be worth something, right? Take advantage of that and get your processes to get things moving back upstream, right? to the front, enable the people who have solved problems in software and test. You'd be surprised how many people in test that I can go on and say, hey, there's an upfront problem. They're like, well, did you think of this? It's the mindset. They're always looking at problems. They're problem solvers. They gotta figure out things, right? Engineering disciplines. 
They're, it may not be equivalent to what you're doing, but I'd recommend walk into your engineering departments, ask someone, even if it's a marketing thing, even if it's you know user interface, go in there and just say, hey, we're having something. You'll get a unique perspective based on years of experience, and those voices have to percolate up. All right, with that being said, I'll turn it back over. As I mentioned earlier, this product was just not just a concept. It really was a crash program. Most, most FAA programs take anywhere to 18 to 24 months to develop a product. Uh, if you look at this product, it took about 12 months, and in, inclusive of that was two months of FAA certification testing that went along the way. We've actually went into production at the end of Ju July. We're building 20 units a month. So this is real. You know, we, produ we produced over 150 of these units. We're actually going into another revision of the, of the design to increase the uh, maintainability and the MTBF of the units. So we're always learning. And basically, we needed to get this product out very quickly for the customer. We're able to achieve that and take it all the way from the point of them giving us an initial design, going through two, two, iter two to three iterations of hardware, through certification, and now into production. So where do we go from here? Well, I think all of you would agree you're never done, especially with a product like this. You're always being asked to come up with an evolving, evolving look at where is the business going from the, from the passenger to the, the airline through GoGo -Go all the way back to us and relative to the evolving demands. From our standpoint, we're always looking at, again, faster processors, increased storage. We're looking at new connectivity schemes. Uh, potentially when you're on the ground for connecting over cellular networks for gathering more content information. There's new terrestrial modems that are coming out every day. Um, there are new satellite modems that are coming out every day. So again, from our perspective, the product's never done. It's just evolving from where we started 12 months ago to where we'll be even two to three years from now. So as we talk about sort of in summary here, what we really were trying to communicate here is that we had to build an infrastructure of innovation to support that innovation so that it actually could happen. And I think to do that, you have to have people, you know, I'm sort of on the front end and I work with people on the back end, I'm blessed to, to be able to do that. And we can pull those people in very readily. And again, as Dave mentioned, I would really encourage you guys to do that as well because you will get a different perspective and look at something in a, in a new way and grow yourself. And that's what's the most important. So really my question here is how do you apply this, right? You think about the modularity aspect of it, right? The, the Phillips gentleman talked about uh, technology platforms and building something sort of once to reuse multiple times versus building something every year, every, every production cycle, and then that costs time and resources and finances that you might not necessarily have. You know, and then thinking about an extreme situation like this, right? This is a device that goes onto an airplane, and there's obviously critical components to that. And again, maybe you work in an industry that's not like that. But I think if you sort of put yourself in that perspective and, and think from that, challenge yourself, put a constraint on your programs and your processes to think like that, I think that would sort of be stepping out of the bounds and looking at analogous industries so you can grow from that. So I would ask you, is there any insights or questions for us or how we went about that or any other thoughts? Sure. Uh, question. Uh, well, first of all, I was wondering how we got my five minutes. Thanks for explaining that. You guys seem to be very smart and driven in that space. I'm, I mean, that's new in our lifetime, though. So I'm wondering, was there a time where you guys felt like that wasn't possible and where you had to overcome that? And then did you encounter people that told you it wasn't possible and had to overcome that, too? Well, if you go back, Boeing, Connections by Boeing was a service that was offered back in, I want to say, the 2002, 2003 timeframe. They probably spent $2 billion, and they shut the business down in 2005. So I would say that... You know, the technology, like the personal devices, wasn't there at the time. The only laptop computers you had were big luggables. And this environment really didn't make it very easy to work in. What's happened, though, along the lines of smart tablets, smartphones coming along, that was the enabler to allow this technology to evolve. So even back in 2002, operation over a satellite while an airplane was moving at 500 miles an hour was there. It's just now the devices are catching up. And that's the thing that's really driving this industry is your devices, if you think about it, you're probably buying new ones every 18 to 24 months, or your company is, and they constantly are coming out with more and more apps that have more and more memory, have more and more performance requirements on them. And all that's doing is putting 
not only the impact of somebody like Goga, but think about the Verizons of the world and the AT&Ts of the world, how much you're putting on their network. You know, you're watching a football game tonight that could not have been done five years ago on any other networks. So it's really the devices and it's people like yourselves that are using them that's really pushing the technology. And just in general, from a technology point of view, and being in the consulting business, you know, I like to think that nothing's impossible until it's shown based on the fact that it's going to cost too much or that you just can't, you know, you get to the point of doing it, but you have to have that open mind that, you know, you look at all the avenues, look at all the partners that are out there, you know, knowledge sharing and leveraging, right? Someone out there has some good ideas, and if you may not have them, how do you reach out, you know, to still achieve the goals, partner, partnerships, and, you know, the idea is nothing should be impossible. It's just a matter of time, right? Time and money. But, but to, to that point, timing is obviously very critical, right? You, you might have the right innovation, but be at the wrong time and launch it too early, and the sort of ecosystem isn't necessarily there. Other question? Yeah, I said this, I know this is a very mundane question, but with three different teams and three different locations and, and uh, methodology to go through and iterate, how does your documentation keep up with your communication? Because it seems like your, your conversations are going to outpace your ability to put that on paper. And that's where some of the online tools that actually come in because you're documenting it in the tool that does require, you can have it set up to do requirements management, you can have it set up to do work items, bug tracking, and everything. And then once it's there, it exports reports, it puts stuff together. From the regulatory side, you know, that all has to be handled and that's, you know, from some of the you know, certification testing and everything, that's different. That's still, I'll let him speak to, you know, that process and the paperwork that's involved there from purely meeting the FAA stuff. But from that collaborative process, if we didn't use something that was online that everyone can go to and basically get a dashboard of what every person's working on, what the priority issue it is, when it's due, and if there's in the comments that there's some risk, you wouldn't have been able to do it. Because every day we'd go in there, look at what everyone's work items are, seeing if they're flagging risks. If they're flagging risk, okay, what was our contingency plan? Already getting it ramped up, right? Before that happens, I already had three different ways. Who I'm pulling in, when I'm pulling them in, and what I'm doing, trying to stay ahead of it, because nothing goes right. And you have to understand that if you don't plan for things to go wrong, things are gonna go really wrong. And that's that's the hard part to get out of. Yeah, I think, I think to add to Dave's point, when it comes to the FAA, they're very much paper driven and very, very structured. We talked about three companies, you know, GoGo, Telephonics, and PDT. There's actually probably at least three more. There was a company in India that was doing the layer three software development for GoGo. There were there was a company in New York that was doing the FAA certification and witnessing of all our testing. There was another firm down in Mississippi that was actually the one pulling together all of the package and representing, representing everything to the FAA. So there was even more companies involved. And basically what you end up doing is you end up partitioning some of that work, like the very structured FAA work, you dedicate people to work on it and you make sure that everybody knows what the roles and responsibilities are. On the development side, let's say with the with the software firm in India, that was a bit of a challenge because we didn't necessarily know what they were writing code to until we actually started to see comments coming back and realized, well, they misinterpreted how this API was supposed to run. Here's how it was supposed to run. Or we're going to change the API because it will make it easier for them. So there's a lot of back and forth um, give and take between the teams to make it as easy as possible to get as quickly to market. I'd say that dance, I, I think it's a good visual for people to try and keep in mind. You have all those different things going on, and how do you space this floor to make sure that that FAA stuff has to go on, and if they hit a hiccup, it doesn't affect this guy that's trying to go over here. You know, if the people have to form the bridge at the right time, if you know that that guy and the, the, their partner aren't coming down the middle, what's gonna happen, right? There's chaos, right? So how do you how do you organize it? I think that's a, you know, a pretty good visual to put in people's heads. You have limited space, Everyone still has to do what they need to do. How do you do it as efficiently as possible? So thank you for your time. If you, um, the one more thing, if, if you uh, haven't tried GoGo, -Go, we have a few coupons. So please come by our booth and visit us. And the first 10, I think we only have 10 of them. So come by and meet us and we'll uh, give these out. One more question. Well, I think from our, from our standpoint, 
I would almost consider everything we do being reference designs. So as we build a product, we'll do a post-mortem and we'll learn from it. And then oftentimes other co companies will come to us with similar types of problems. We try to leverage off of the, maybe the existing design and we go from there. Say like going with a new processor. Um, we still might end up using the same type of switching functionality within the board. We'll reuse software wherever we can in order to leverage that. In terms of suppliers though, I mean, what we end up doing is we end up identifying key suppliers that we stay consistent with. If we have problems with them, we work through the problems, but we try not to go and change suppliers. Like in the area of a power supply, we always work with the same power supply vendor because we know what we can expect from him and we know that you know, when it comes down to final testing, everything that he's done in the past, we've been very successful with. So we try not to change up the mix. If we obviously have a bad supplier, then we have to go and look for, look for other alternatives. But I think we've been fortunate enough that some of our suppliers have been very good and we've been able to leverage them from one project to another. Yeah, we leverage a lot of other, so for a consulting firm, we have our own processes and for like individual developers or, or private, uh, I'll call them like entrepreneurs that are looking to get stuff done. But most of the time, a lot of these companies have their own process and trying to wiggle ourselves in there, understand it quick so that it's seamless and we don't interrupt what they're already doing. It's, it's, very, it's very much a challenge in trying to come up to speed. And every project's unique. And it gives us a great you know, perspective when we actually get to the next challenge. You know, we have a lot of insights into a lot of different things that have gone wrong and different things and how do you apply what you've learned so you don't do it again. Thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thank you.